Hello and thank you for joining today's webinar, Preparing Newcomers for the Jobs of Today and the Labor Markets of Tomorrow. A conversation that promises to be very compelling and forward-looking indeed. But before we delve into the topic, let me very briefly introduce myself. My name is Liam Patuzzi. I'm a research officer and analyst at EBB, a Cologne and Berlin-based organization where I mainly work on projects to support the labor market integration of migrants, such as the Network IQ. Until January of this year, I was an associate policy analyst at MPI Europe, where I had the opportunity to do some exciting work on innovation for refugee inclusion and the future of integration policy. So I'm very honored to be the moderator of today's webinar. Allow me to just very briefly welcome our speakers of today. We have a great panel made up of diverse expertise. Uh, first, I would like to welcome Megan Benton from the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. A warm welcome also to Wolfgang Müller from the Federal Employment Agency of Germany, the Bundesagentur für Arbeit. And last but not least, welcome to Ben Mason from Better Place Lab, a Berlin-based nonprofit organization. And I will say a few more words about them before their respective presentation. As a next step, I would just like to give you some housekeeping notes for you to consider. The audio of the webinar will be on the website later today, uh, migrationpolicy.org forward slash events. Should you experience any technical problem, please email events at migrationpolicy.org or call plus one two zero two two six six one nine two nine. If you have problems hearing via the web, please dial in using the call-in information you should have received earlier via email. And uh, this webinar will have a Q&A part, which will follow our speakers' presentations. Um, there will be no voice Q&A, but you may send in your questions in written form. And there are three ways to do that. Um, either you use the Q&A function on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you will be there during the entire webinar, or you can email your question to events at migrationpolicy.org. Alternatively, you can tweet your questions to at migrationpolicy or hashtag MPI discuss. I'd also like to quickly mention that this webinar is part of the Integration Futures Working Group, and it is supported by the Robert Bosch Foundation. It marks the release of two new MPI Euro publications, which two of our speakers, Megan Benton and Ben Mason, will briefly present. First one is titled, Jobs in 2028, How Will Changing Labor Markets Affect Immigrant Integration in Europe? Authored by Megan Benton and myself, Liam Patuzzi. The second one is called, Tech Jobs for Refugees, Assessing the Potential of Coding Schools for Refugee Integration in Germany written by Ben Mason, who is also on this panel. Before I hand over to the first speaker, just a few words to introduce the topic. There are numerous studies on the future of work, buzzwords such as digitization, gig economy, flexible work culture, automation, will certainly ring a bell with most of you. Strikingly, however, the debate on the future of work is often conducted rather separately from discussions around integration and participation of newcomers, which is another major task Europe has to face in years and decades to come. Many governments in Europe have significantly ramped up their investments in immigrant integration in recent years. At the same time, we know that the economic integration of newcomers, and particularly refugees, is a long-term task. Therefore, for these increased investments to be successful in the long run, factoring in the rapid shifts in labor markets and in the world of work is absolutely crucial. Newcomers, and indeed all citizens, need to be equipped with the skills to thrive in the job markets of the future. We will start this webinar from a more theoretical approach to the topic at hand, inspired by a methodology that is typical of future studies namely developing scenarios. This look at possible futures will highlight how high the stakes are and why it is crucial to plan and act ahead. We will then take on the perspective of a national employment agency, 
which will allow us to see how state organizations envision labor market support in a new world of work and how they factor in immigrant inclusion in this equation. And lastly, to make the topic even more tangible, we will get some insight into coding schools for refugees, a type of initiative that has sprouted in Europe and beyond in recent years. Coding schools are of great relevance here as they try to explore the opportunities an increasingly tech-driven labor market holds in store for refugees and other typically disadvantaged groups. Moreover, some of the innovative solutions for refugee inclusions developed in recent years may, improve, may provide inspiration as to how mainstream policies should be adapted for the future of work, where frequent job changes, uneven professional biographies, and the need for frequent retraining are likely to become normal for everyone, not only newcomers. But now, without losing further time, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, Megan Benton. Megan is a senior policy analyst and assistant director for research at MPI, as well as a non-resident fellow with MPI Europe. One of her main, many areas of expertise is the role of technological and social innovation for the inclusion of migrants and refugees, on which she has written extensively. And she will discuss findings from the paper Jobs in 2028, How Will Changing Labor Markets Affect Immigrant Integration in Europe? Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Liam, and thanks for um, your very nice and uh, compelling introduction. Um, I'm just going to share a few headlines from the report that, uh, as Liam said, we, we co-authored. It was released yesterday. It's called Jobs in 2028, How Will Changing Labour Markets Affect Immigrant Integration in Europe? Um, the paper was commissioned for a meeting of the Integration Futures Working Group. Um, Liam mentioned this is initiative, an initiative sponsored by uh, the Robert Bosch Foundation. It's a platform of integration policymakers and invited experts, um, people from the private sector, civil society, that's trying to develop a fresh agenda for integration policy in Europe. And I really think this topic of how the changing world of work might affect immigrant integration is really at the heart of the goals of this initiative, which is to encourage more um, whole system thinking, to be more strategic and deliberate in planning for challenges around the corner, not just constantly being uh, absorbed by the crises of today, uh, and to bring the most innovative policies and practices from areas outside of integration to bear on integration issues. And this is all important, as Liam alluded to, because you have to make sure the decisions that we're making now are the right ones. Um, uh, there's lots of investments going into the area of labor market integration policy, so it's worth thinking about um, the long-term pro prognosis of these um, investments. Um, and the paper was really motivated by concerns that we are not doing enough thinking about the way that changing trends in the labor market might interact with or even exacerbate existing integration challenges. Uh, and it was also motivated by a sense that conversations about integration and conversations about automation, labor market disruption, were essentially happening in parallel universes, um, but that these two areas could really speak to one another and learn from one another. Now, I know I'm speaking to um, a heavily migration-y audience, uh, since we are MPI, and a very knowledgeable audience about immigrant integration issues. So I won't bother um, going over the, the very established patterns that you know very well, but just to say that the paper discusses how many labor market integration challenges, um, uh, so newcomers who find it difficult to get their first foothold on the ladder, um, brain waste among people who, who can't use their qualifications because they can't get them recognized, uh, and then migrants and refugees who arrive through non-selected routes, so through um, family unification or through humanitarian um, channels, um, who might have quite limited skills, they might be dealing with um, psychological distress or trauma and are very far from the labor market. All of these different pockets of challenges that make up the world of labor market integration could be potentially made worse in the future if we are facing shrinking numbers of low and middle skilled jobs. Now, the paper is intentionally a little provocative. Um, as Liam described, it takes this uh, sort of futures foresight approach. It sets out 
four scenarios that could arise in relation to how labour markets evolve um, and how governments respond to these trends um, across areas such as social protection, education um, and other public services and integration policy. And I'd encourage you all to read the scenarios because I don't have time to summarise them and there's a very neat uh, summary uh, on one of the first pages. Um, just some light um, breakfast or lunch reading for you all. But we basically say that at one side of the extreme, um, we could see um, considerable polarisation and rising inequality in the labour market with large-scale job losses to automation that the governments are unprepared for, um, a sort of growth in gig economy or precarious work situations, or even um, employment in the informal economy being the only options for particularly vulnerable and unskilled migrants. And that would not be good for migrants themselves, for receiving communities, or for social cohesion more broadly. Um, but at the other end of the extreme, and there are a few positive-ish scenarios in this paper, um, one option is that we could see a sort of blossoming of new forms of, of non-traditional work, uh, a rise in entrepreneurship that uh, in fact makes it easier for a lot of newcomers to circumvent some of the traditional barriers that they have faced in the labour market, such as lack of networks, uh, lack of host country work experience, um, lack of host country qualifications. We could also find new ways to get economic and social value from people that don't look exactly like work, but are approximate to work. This might mean um, greater voluntary or community service programs, um, people informally caring for their neighbours, um, that adds social value and, in fact, economic value, particularly in an ageing society, without necessarily being traditional work. Now, the problem with these scenarios and why planning in this area is so difficult is that there's just so much uncertainty about the scale of disruption from automation, artificial intelligence, and digitization. I mean, if you look at estimates from economists, they vary so widely. Uh, I mean, from like 8% to 50% of jobs um, potentially at risk of disappearing. Um, and obviously, it varies heavily by country, and one of the big unknowns is what the jobs are that will be created that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that no planning can happen, and I think the big takeaway, the big argument of this report is that there needs to be much more cross-governmental collaboration on issues to help us um, pr prevent us from going further towards the worst-case scenario. Uh, which I think would be bad for migrants themselves and for receiving communities. Um, the point the paper makes is that workers displaced by technology have lots of the same challenges as newly arrived migrants and refugees. They essentially find, in some cases, that their skills aren't in demand in the local labor market. So the problem is one of, of skills mismatch, and it requires many of the same policies to address. That means um, ability to retrain rapidly for jobs that are on offer, um, more holistic and intensive support with career planning, um, better systems to match employers and jobs, lifelong learning so that people keep their jobs up to date even when they're within work. But perhaps most importantly, the fundamental challenge, I think, for future labour markets is that we need to get much, much better at recognising skills and helping workers translate these skills across all kinds of borders. So not just geographical ones anymore, but occupational ones, sectoral ones. This question of how you help um, a veteran retrain for the civilian world or how you help someone who used to work um, in manufacturing to move into construction, these questions are all very similar to how you help a newly arrived immigrant who doesn't have uh, skills in demand locally translate the skills that they do have for the local labor market. So the more positive story that the paper ends with is that there's a lot that integration and employment policymakers have to learn from one another and vice versa, um, but it's important that they speak to one another, which is why we're trying to open this dialogue um, today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Megan, also for uh, for this brilliant presentation, also for pointing out that um, I think it's really important uncertainty as you said, uncertainty does not mean that no planning can happen. And um, and also for highlighting that the purpose of this paper, which of course can um, sound a bit visionary in some instances, 
is not, of course, predictive in, in a strict sense, but uh, to show how different trends may play out with each other and what we can do to avoid the worst case scenario. Um, and as you already mentioned, also this uh, cross-governmental and also cross-stakeholder collaboration is certainly something that we might touch on later. But without further ado, I would li like to introduce our next speaker for the day. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Wolfgang Müller, who is the Managing Director for European Cooperation at the Bundesagentur für Arbeit, the Federal Employment Agency of Germany. And he also co-represents the German Federal Employment Agency on the board of uh, the European Network of Public Employment Services. Wolfgang will offer a perspective on the Work 4.0, um, a consultation the German government launched a few years ago to prepare for wide-ranging transformations in the world of work. And he will also offer some insights into how the Federal Employment Service is preparing for labor market disruptions in Germany, a country where, due to the intensity of recent flow, there is a particularly strong case for thinking about the future of work in the same breath with uh, immigrant integration. So Wolfgang, uh, thanks for being here and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Liam, for the kind introduction and thank you for uh, um, <clears throat> inviting me to participate uh, in this debate. Uh, yeah, let me first uh, start with um, the, a more general overview of uh, how we look at um, the changes um, that will come up uh, and what it means for the future of, of labor markets and how we as a public employment service are trying to, to prepare ourselves and to, to react to those developments. But then, of course, um, I would uh, especially focus on um, on the perspective of migration and how that fits in, into, into the, the overall equation of that. So, um, I mean, drivers and trends that will change the, the future of work, that is well known, I will not say anything. So what, is, what are the implications um, um, that, that um, are happening? And I think these implications, um, they are in, in so many different areas. It's, so it's uh, privacy, data protection, it's um, health and safety uh, issue, it's about uh, social security, it's about um, entrepreneurship, uh, it's about um, qualification in, in, the, in the widest uh, sense. So those are the areas that have to be looked at. And that, as you know, the Germans, um, they never do anything without a plan in a, in a very structured way. So our government, our Ministry of Labor, they launched um, a public uh, consultation, a green book on that, um, followed by a white book. So um, where the, 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 the public, but also experts and research institute, into, uh, institutes were asked to deliver their insights and their opinions, what that means and what areas have to be addressed. And um, as an outcome of that, there was a, there was a dialogue initiated between or among the society. Um, it's a, a dialogue uh, on the future um, of, of work, um, and, and that that started uh, uh, just uh, this year. So uh, it's it's ongoing, and uh, we hope to to get um, a report on that uh, in September next year. So that's. That's the, um, what is happening at, at the national level. So what are the implications for public employment service? And that is what I'm speaking about because I'm from the public employment service. Um, I would name probably it's, it's like only three areas. Um, so one would be that uh, our clients, our customer groups are changing. So we have to look at completely different customers um, as we did in the past. In the past, you know, we only had the unemployed people, period. That's it. Um, and then, you know, it, somebody in the later found out it would be good to look also at the other side of the market, so the employer. But now um, we have to look at um, 
at uh, different players um, and different kind of uh, employers or different kind of partners uh, with whom we have to work together. So that's one. Um, the second is definitely new forms of work, um, and that has implications for Social Security, and therefore, if they're entitled for unemployment benefits and to what kind of services we are going to offer. So that is changing. And, um, and Megan already mentioned that, and I think it's an important issue that um, the, um, the importance of skills and competences is getting much bigger um, in comparison to the past and in comparison to qualifications. So um, once again, uh, we Germans love our certificates, but we have to rethink that, that we say, yes, but there's much more than just the competences that are under a qualification. And we have to put that together to get a complete picture of a person. So um, those are, I think, the, the, the um, implications for public employment services. Um, the, now let me turn to what does it, or with, with the perspective of migration. Um, but there, I think it's very important to make a difference between what kind of migration we are talking about. So, of course, we... And you all know that in Germany, we have a lack of skilled labor, labor market situation is very favorable, and the demographic effect is already taking place. So we have a, a need for skilled labor. And now it depends on your, your migration scheme, um, the paradigm um, that you have. Uh, it can be supply-based or demand-led. Um, so like a point system, the former point system in Canada, a more supply Based system, but the German approach is a demand um, led. So we have a, a very specific demand with a vacancy from the company, and that is the starting point to look abroad for skilled workers. So, in principle, there you have also two options. You can look for the perfect or nearly perfect fit, and therefore there is no need for adaption of the, of the profile. Uh, of that person, and not so much because, you know, you are looking for a specific job profile of that vacancy, and that person brings it with them. So, you know, the adjustment is not really big. Or you say, look, um, I know it's very difficult to find them. I, you know, half of what is looked for is sufficient, and the rest I do an upskilling here when he arrived in Germany. So. Those, those are the options we have to think about. And, um, well, and then, of course, um, when we go back from the economic migration, we have the humanitarian migration. And there, of course, and it should never be, of course, it's not a criteria, um, you, you're not looking for a fit <laughs> of anything. But once they are there, definitely, you have to think about uh, that. And I think you have got a lot of opportunities, but of course, a lot of challenges coming with that. Opportunities is that with the new forms of work, I already mentioned this um, one trend that will happen, is that there are opportunities. For example, um, when you look at uh, cloud working or other forms of more temporary work, um, that very often is an entry point for those who do not have, I would say, a full set of qualification and competences. So that creates opportunities. On the other side, you have got disadvantages because the unskilled part of the economy is decreasing, at least in Germany. Um, it's not the same in every country, but in Germany it is happening. So uh, you have new forms of work, but at the same time for unskilled, it is not, it is not the best environment or, or when we talk about volume. Um, so that, that, is, that is one thing. The other thing, once again, positive is that um, the skills and competences are, are, are becoming the attention, uh, more and more attention, um, are getting the attention. Um, so, because they do not, in principle, bring qualifications that 
we understand as public employment service, uh, as a national public employment service, because they were made somewhere abroad. But when you go away from the qualifications and you look more deeply into skills and competences, then you, you find better points, starting points for labor market integration. So um, once again, um, I think that is, an, that is an advantage. But definitely us as institutions, and uh, with that I, I close uh, my introductory remarks, is that um, the, the needs um, our, our, our capacity, capability for a different kind of profiling, a different kind of matching, um, and um, a different understanding of what does it mean to be a transition broker and to, to create lifelong learning opportunities and to, to um, work in a, in a sense of a career management that uh, is something that um, uh, will be uh, our challenge, how we adapt as an organization. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for this uh, very interesting introduction to your work, also for highlighting the fluidity of the context in which you are currently working and all the questions that the, this large organization needs to answer to uh, you know, be, uh, stay ahead of the curve also in the future. Uh, changing customer groups, uh, adapting to new forms of work. And I also um, found it very interesting that you uh, stressed one point Megan already raised, namely the growing importance also of non-formal and informal skills and the need to uh, develop ways uh, to Im improve the transferability of these skills from between countries, between sectors, etc. Um, I would now like to introduce the last speaker for today. Um, his name is Ben Mason, as uh, previously announced. Um, he will discuss opportunities offered by coding schools for refugees, summarizing his paper, Tech Jobs for Refugees, Assessing the Potential of Coding Schools for Refugee Integration in Germany, which will also be released today uh, and available on the MPI website. Um, this example of coding schools can give us a more concrete idea of how the future of immigrant integration and the future of work may intersect. Um, ben Mason is a researcher and a project lead at Better Place Lab, a Berlin-based nonprofit think tank. And for the last two years, he has been leading the lab's work on digital technology and its benefits for refugees and other migrants. Ben Mason, Ben, we're excited to, to hear your presentation. Go ahead. Thank you, Liam. Uh, and thanks also to MPI, uh, both for organizing the event today and for making this research possible. So in this research paper, as you say, we take a look at, or I take a look at refugee coding schools. And these are programs to train refugees in software development. And we've seen several of these programs emerge over the past two or three years in Germany and beyond. There's 16 that we know of internationally. Now, when you, hear, when you first hear the concept explained, the, the idea behind it, uh, I know that my first reaction was it seems extremely elegant. It seems like a very neat solution. Why is that? Um, so from the host community side, uh, as Wolfgang already mentioned, there is a, a, a shortage of skilled labors in the IT industry. Uh, according to one industry estimate, there are over 50,000 unfilled IT jobs in Germany. And then from the refugee side, or if you like the integration side, IT software development seems like a particularly well-suited and accessible profession, especially relative, you know, given the fact that it's high income, high status job, arguably future-proof. It's accessible uh, because of language. So the working language in uh, tech companies or in tech teams is often English. And we know that uh, many of the refugees have arrived into Germany in the past few years uh, from Syria, for example, already come with English skills, but, but no German skills. It has the reputation, the IT industry, of placing less emphasis on formal qualifications. This is something that Wolfgang uh, described in detail already, but the IT industry, more than others, 
places a focus on competence and skills and experience rather than necessarily needing to see certificates. It's possible to advance to senior positions, at least according to the reputation, uh, without, without an undergraduate degree. Software development is a skill set that is portable, again, well suited to, uh, to refugees or migrants who may at some point in the future return to their home countries or, or move on. This is a skill set which uh, will allow them to uh, move to another country and, and gain, uh, have a good chance of gaining employment there. So roughly speaking, that's the, that's the starting premise, that's the logic behind this idea, this, this attractive win-win situation both for, uh, both for the newcomer and for the host society, or uh, a win both from integration policy side and also economic or labour market side. And because of that attractive logic, uh, we've seen a number of people motivated to start coding schools in the past few years, and they've attracted considerable support, financial support, also media attention. Now, as far as I know, this is the first research that's been done to, to test those assumptions, to see how well they, they measure up. And it's research that I, carried out by conducting interviews with uh, a number of people running coding schools and also with students and alumni who've taken part in these courses, as well as people working in the IT industry to get a sense of the requirements that people would need in order to be employable in that sector. In the paper, I profile three, three projects of this kind in Germany. That's uh, Ready School, and DevFugees, both based in Berlin, and a third called Codedor, which is which is based in Gießen, uh, a city in the south of Germany, and is mainly uh, active in the south of Germany. The research essentially supported the starting assumptions, the logic that I described just now, but with some important caveats. So, for example, it seems that in the IT industry. Uh, in contrast with a lot of other workplaces in Germany, it is possible to get by in English. However, German certainly does help, is important in some, in some regards. Similarly, it is, in, it is certainly possible to get a job as a software developer, as a coder, without a degree, without formal qualifications. But that's not to say that a degree is completely without value, that has no relevance on, on employability or what employers are looking for. Uh, thirdly, and this is by far the most important caveat and what, what I try to highlight in the paper, it has to do with the profile of what it takes to thrive in the IT industry to become a software developer. And the point is that uh, the hard skills uh, mastering programming languages, for example, the hard skills which can be taught at these coding schools, yes, they're necessary, but they're certainly not sufficient in order to really flourish in, in that industry. The hard skills need to be supplemented by soft skills, advanced interpersonal and intercultural skills, and in particular, high level cognitive skills. I'm talking about uh, the ability for self-directed learning in order to stay on top of such a fast-moving field to keep abreast of, of the newest technology. And so where the paper leads to the conclusion is that yes, the IT industry arguably does offer fewer structural barriers to refugees, migrants and newcomers. But it is by no means accessible to everyone. We need to be realistic that the number of, of developers, software engineers that these coding schools can produce is, uh, is likely to be limited. It's, it's a relatively high investment lever that we're talking about here as an intervention. However, the, the rewards are high, or the potential rewards are high, even if the, the numbers remain modest. And there are, there are a number of spillover benefits, even if the number of people actually getting a job as a software developer remains low, people can still nevertheless profit 
uh, from, the, from the sense of community that these programs offer and through the fact that an increasing number of jobs requires a grounding in IT skills. So it, it can increase people's overall employability, even if they don't, in the end, become software developers. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Ben, for, uh, well, first of all, for illustrating the main constitutive elements of what makes uh, these programs attractive. You mentioned, uh, well, working in English language, uh, less emphasis on formal qualifications, the portability of skills, but also for uh, yeah, explaining to us what the main caveats are, uh, which of course can also help advancing and further developing uh, these interesting models. Um, also, it's great that you bring in soft skills, cognitive skills, and also intercultural competence, um, because it's definitely something that uh, yeah, many experts identify as becoming increasingly important in, in future labor markets where, for instance, learning to learn uh, will, uh, yeah, will have increasing centrality. Um, that said, uh, we're through with the first uh, introducing introductory remarks from all speakers. I would like to, uh, well, thank them all for now. And I think we are just now going to move on to the questions and answers portion of this webinar. So. Um, I would like to invite everyone to either use the Q&A chat function on your screen on the right-hand side or to email your questions to events at migrationpolicy.org. Alternatively, you can also send us your questions via Twitter, either to at migrationpolicy or hashtag MPI discuss. So, we've got a few questions already and I think... Um, I will direct the first one to uh, you, Megan. Um, how can you protect workers in the gig economy? Um, thanks, Liam. And this is a question I wish uh, I knew the answer to. Many people do. Um, the, I mean, Wolfgang alluded to some of the. Um, the opportunities that the gig economy and crowd work and these new forms of kind of flexible labor can offer for newcomers. Um, and in fact, even for second generation migrants who face some discrimination on the labor market, um, driving an Uber is sometimes a very quick pathway to um, uh, earning an income when they struggle to find work through other avenues. Um, crowd work, work that you can do from home, maybe an alternative if you are um, if, if you've been located as a refugee in an area which is um, distant from most economic opportunities. So there are lots of kind of reasons why these flexible forms of labor can offer a, a very quick pathway um, to newcomers. But the problem is they don't necessarily offer uh, any opportunities for upward progression. Um, if someone is operating um, as a kind of sole trader by delivering groceries or um, driving an Uber or um, doing handiwork around someone's home, they're not necessarily building the meaningful interactions with colleagues and the sort of social ties um, that we would count as kind of full integration. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we don't know very much about whether there are, you know, what, what the kind of trade offs are and whether there are benefits and drawbacks and what someone's trajectory looks like who is a newcomer who uses these new forms of flexible labor as a pathway to integration. Um, the data on the gig economy is really poor. Um, the U.S. has this um, new survey, or in fact a revived survey that they came out with this year, which is called the Contingent Worker Survey, um, which does make it possible to disaggregate by nationality. But in the EU, there isn't anything similar. So even though we kind of anecdotally think that um, migrants are overrepresented in these jobs, we actually don't know whether that's the case. So I think there's definitely a need for more data, which is a classic researcher's thing to say. But... Um, mm -hmm. There's obviously a kind of debate about labor protections and regulation that is very important and has come up in lots of recent court cases and will continue to kind of rear its head in the coming years. I mean, this isn't just about things like labor protections and minimum pay. And there, I think there's a balance to be had because a lot of people are in these sorts of jobs through choice. It does work under certain conditions. It's just that it can become a problem if they don't have 
opportunities to uh, make a full income. Um, but the, some of the more important things to think about is what their sort of long-term prospects are. So how are they saving for their retirement? Um, in, in, in the US, for instance, do they have access to health insurance, dental insurance? Um, and there are some kind of promising um, initiatives that are trying to kind of solve um, this problem for not just people who work in the gig economy, but increasingly freelancers, um, which might include, you know, high-skilled millennials working on their iBooks in coffee shops. Um, I think I saw an estimate that almost half of millennials um, are freelance in some way now, which is a fascinating finding. Um, so there are various initiatives that do things like um, help people ensure that they receive a basic income, even if their clients don't pay, um, how do they save for, save for their retirement, um, that are very promising to look at. Um, but I do think that the role of training um, and the role of employers, or at least gig economy, big tech gig economy actors, has kind of been underused here. There have been a few examples of um, Lyft, the ride-sharing company, um, offering training to its drivers. But really, these companies haven't yet stepped up to think through what their role is as a kind of agent of integration. You know, should they be providing advice on financial inclusion, banking, financial management, language learning? Um, and how could they, you know, provide a, a more of a supportive role? And then what could the government do in order to ensure that people can access training um, in their own time in ways that fit around a sort of like mismatched, um, um, inconsistent schedule so that they can um, learn the language, develop their skills, and ultimately become more, more full members of their new societies. Thanks a lot, Megan, for this very insightful answer. Um, we've got a couple um, questions that um, I okay. could summarize and direct to Ben, if that's okay. Um, so the question would summarize is like, how can uh, coding schools as a model or the lessons that we can learn from them also be applied uh, to, a, to a large pool of, of newcomers and refugees, and perhaps not to those who already have a knowledge of, of tech or tech skills. So uh, not just the, the, the better skills, but yeah, to also uh, larger groups that might be usually harder to reach. Yeah, thank you, Liam. It's, it's an interesting question. I, I think that reaching low skilled people is is not the issue here i think that uh looking at uh the the, the students and the refugees who who are ready and and refugees are the programs are working with they're from a, a a wide range of backgrounds and i know they've worked hard at this uh because the, the people who are easiest to reach as it's sort of implicit in your question are people who already have probably a high level of of education uh, and in many ways people least uh, the people least in need of, of help and support uh, but I think that they've created courses that are accessible enough that, uh, that a bright, broad range of people can can begin them I think that the really tricky part comes looking at it from the other side of what's a realistic um, what's a realistic expectation of outcomes so that's what I tried to get at in my introductory remarks I think that you can train a lot of people and the majority of them will get some benefit I think that there's a risk if there's inflated expectations that all of the people that you uh, that you're dealing with are going to walk into a job as a, as a junior developer. Uh, my research and, and the interviews in particular with people working in the IT sector suggest that it's a job that's particularly suited to, to, to certain people. And I think that previous education only play is only one dimension among amongst others people uh, my interviewees describe a certain way of thinking approaching problem solving and people who who are natural at this or this this is what i was told by my interviewees uh can really flourish even with a lack of formal education by the same token other people who who from, from a much more privileged background 
will struggle to make the cut no matter what, what support is given. So, so I think that the, the I think the issue you describe in the question is, is really important of which groups or subgroups within the refugee community do you reach? I think that's something that the refugee that the refugee coding schools have on their agenda and are very mindful of and have been working at for some time. Um, my reservations are more looking at looking at the outcomes. I think. Okay, uh, Liam, great. if you want, I can I can add to those yes. two uh, questions. Um, yes, from, that would from, be great. You know, from from the ground experience. Um, Absolutely. When it comes to protection, um, I think, I mean, there are always two sides. One is, well, I mean, it's in the United States, it's not so common. Um, but, um, well, at least in Europe, we have the passive labor market policy and the active labor market policy. So the passive is the unemployment benefits. And, of course, everything depends on what are the conditions that have to be met to be entitled for unemployment benefit. So. Uh, when you look at the traditional way um, of work, well, then, of course, with the changing world of work, um, you will have less and less people being entitled because their careers are interrupted. So they, they do not meet the conditions, and therefore they are not protected um, by, you know, getting money to, to continue and nearly the same kind of life. And then, of course, once you are entitled for the unemployment benefits, well, then we have active labor market policy, and that is the re- and upskilling. So, but once again, usually there is a strong connection. Only if you are entitled for unemployment benefits, you are entitled for reskilling, upskilling, placement services, counseling, and so on. So um, the way is you have to change the conditions or you start introducing active labor market policy services to non-benefit recipients. So that could be a way to address those changing work contracts and the growing number of people in those work contracts. And um, an insight that um, with regards to coding and to how that can be used for people further away from the labor market. Um, um, I know it's also a, a, a not a normal situation, but um, the, the financial situation of the German Public Employment Service is great. <laughs> we have a big surplus. So we have earmarked a lot of money in our budget for we and upskilling initiatives, um, especially in IT or technological um, we and upskilling initiatives. We have got an integration quote. Um, that is what we call when we look six months after finishing the course. So uh, do you have an employment contract, yes or no? Um, and the, in the, the integration rate um, is extremely high. It's over 80%. In average, it is only 40%. So across all the, the measures we have. So uh, the, the, the conclusion would be, okay, we put as many people as possible in those we and upskilling initiatives because obviously the result is very positive and that will be taken, that will be absorbed by the economy, by the employers. But, <laughs> so money is not the issue, but we have see, we, we see a lot of problems with motivation. And even if the motivation is there, um, the capability of people to follow, um, and I'm not talking about um, high end qualification measures, um, but even medium skilled. When we come to those further away from the labor market, there are capability problems when it comes to logical thinking, self-reflection. So it's not only soft skill, but it's just, or it's, it's, so it's extremely difficult and to find enough candidates to put them in those classes where we see um, that they, um, will continue until the end of the class and not stop somewhere in the middle. So, and that is the, the problem because that would be a lot of waste of money when we put people just for the sake of putting them in to fill the classes and then they stop in the middle. 
um, and then nothing is getting out of that. So, um, so therefore, uh, we look at the potential of people to maintain <laughs> the, the, the class, the course throughout the mm -hmm. whole time, mm -hmm. and it's getting more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Wolfgang, for well, for one, for highlighting the the trend, very interesting trend from the, from um, rather reactive labor market policy to a more active one, also for the non um, unemployed, um, and also for bringing back this uh, this topic about soft skills or meta skills, uh, how we want to call them, cognitive skills. And in fact, uh, I've got a couple questions that I think I could combine and uh, direct to Ben, because you've also brought it up a couple times talking about coding schools. How, and, and we could link this to a question about what's the next stage of development for coding schools in your, from your observation, but how can you teach such soft cognitive or meta skills? Hmm. Um, that's a difficult question. Or how do these schools try to, try to do it? Well, I think the, the question is whether they're in a position to do it. Uh, the, the part in the paper where, which I think gets at exactly this point is, is looking at the question of having, uh, having degree level education versus, versus not. So as I, said in, as I said in my remarks, it's not an entry requirement into very many tech jobs to, to, have, a, to have a degree in, in computer science or, or whatever else. They're much more prepared to look at, look at competence rather than, uh, rather than um, quali qualification. However, digging a little bit deeper, interviewing both uh, human resources uh, people who, who obviously interview people for jobs, interviewing students and alumni of the coding schools, both graduates and non-graduates, I think that there's something subtle about, there's a subtle advantage to having a degree level education, which goes beyond the hard skills, the knowledge about the technology, which is, uh, I think, people who, I think perhaps some people were too quick to say um, technology is moving quickly enough anyway, knowledge is outdated enough anyway, you don't need to go to university in order to learn the hard skills to be a coder. There's, there's a more subtle aspect of having applied yourself at that level of education uh, and in that sustained way over time, I think generates the kind of um, higher level cognitive skills that we're talking about, the ability to learn how to learn and, and self-directed learning. So I think the answer to your question might ironically be go to university, or I think, I think that that's one of, one of the best measure, uh, one of the best uh, ways that's, that we know of how to do it. And that's not necessarily for the things that you learn there, but, uh, but for the development of, of independent learning. Right, great. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, I have maybe one uh, last question that we received that I could direct to Megan for just a very brief uh, comment on that. Um, and I think it will probably be the last question for today. Um, the question is, could you please expand a bit on the link between transformations in work and the public perceptions around migration and diversity? So how might the, the changing world of work impact uh, public support to to inclusion and diversity. Yeah, well, um, it's it's obviously currently a debate just how much economic trends are behind um, current levels of anxiety to immigration, and I certainly don't think they explain the whole picture. They're definitely um, it's a factor if people feel in competition for their jobs, whether or not that perception is grounded or not, then that does lead to um, greater animosity towards. Um, newcomers um, who can become easy scapegoats. I think the challenge that we articulated in the paper is a little bit more forceful than that, which is that there is a potential scenario where there's much more ethnic segmentation in um, precarious um, jobs 
um, and that they are, there, are, there are fewer low-skilled jobs to go around. There's greater competition for low-skilled jobs. There's more people out of work, and there's a more sort of a precariat, as sometimes people call it, um, which is or, which also overlaps quite heavily with, with with vulnerable groups of all kinds, including migrants. That is a situation that would be extremely bad for social cohesion and would in turn make um, uh, contribute to rising levels of anxiety about immigration, and then make it even harder to do the sort of sensible integration policies that require investments. I mean, the, the catch-22 that countries find themselves in is that it becomes very difficult to invest in integration when they have um, high levels of resistance to migrants and refugees. Um, you need to have the public on board in order to do the smart, innovative, creative, forward-thinking policies. Um, and that's why some of these things need to happen now instead of in 10 years, um, which is really the kind of case that the paper makes. Thanks, Megan. Thanks also for, for highlighting the window of opportunity that is available now for starting or for continuing this plan or this, uh, this exercise of foresight uh, that uh, will be needed in order to yeah, face up to changes, comprehensive changes in labor markets of tomorrow and what they will mean for the inclusion of immigrants and refugees. And on this, um, we are approaching the end of this webinar. Um, apologies if some questions were left unanswered. Um, we did the best we could. I would like to give a warm thank you to our panelists for their insightful contribution. And obviously, due to the very nature of the topic, uh, this will be an ongoing conversation. Who knows, perhaps we will even have another webinar in 10 years just to see how the scenarios have played out. Um, but for the moment, this webinar highlighted Again, how essential it is to draw connections between different trends, policy areas, and also institutions, even where the links are perhaps not uh, immediately evident. So gauging the pace and direction of change in European labor markets requires not only sound data, but also a considerable portion of thinking outside the box. I think that became rather clear today and of coordinated action within government, but also with many other um, agencies, institutions, uh, social organizations, especially if this change is to be harnessed for the benefit of more inclusive societies. I'd also like to thank our participants for joining in today, and hopefully we sparked your curiosity about the reports that were mentioned and which will be released today. Um, the first one is jobs in 2028, how will changing labor markets affect immigrant integration in Europe? which is the paper where well, you will find the scenarios that were briefly referred to. And the second one is tech jobs for refugees, assessing the potential of coding schools for refugee integration in Germany, which is uh, the research project and paper that Ben presented earlier in the webinar. Um, thanks again also to the Robert Bosch Foundation for supporting the Integration Futures project and this webinar in particular. Um, just as a final reminder, you can access the audio recording of this webinar on the MPI website, migrationpolicy.org forward slash events. And if there are any reporters in the webinar who need further information, please contact Michelle Mittelstadt at plus 44 or at plus one two zero two two six six one nine one zero. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye.